I'm Kate Chaplinski for the HAN Network, and February is National Eating Disorder Awareness Month. And we're at Silver Hill Hospital in New Canaan talking with experts about a number of pertinent issues around eating disorders and treatment. And I'm joined today by Dr. Sarah Niego, who is the service chief of the Eating Disorders Program at Silver Hill. Dr. Niego, so happy to have you with so us. So happy to be here. I'm glad to have this topic discussed. So we're going to be talking um, about neurobiology of the brain, including food yes. as medicine. And, yes. and first, let's start with how do you explain eating disorders in terms of of nutrition and neuroscience? Um, you know, eating disorders, like really every other psychiatric disorder, are brain diseases. They are not choices, they are genetically linked. And in terms of um, brain, how do you describe eating disorders? Is there, there is something in the brain of people who ultimately have eating disorders. I would say it's not that they are, um, they come out, they're sort of revealed. Mm -hmm. So the right amount of uh, anxiety in early, you can kind of see features of what mm -hmm. might ultimately be someone who will struggle with an eating disorder early in age. Features like um, extreme anxiety, rigidity, difficult to soothe child mm -hmm. uh, can lead to, in the context of malnutrition, uh, really kind of kicking in and the brain, the brain disease really shows itself. So these things come out with malnutrition. They're there though to start and wow. that's really interesting. Now, so in the brain of those that have eating disorders, what might lead to those dysfunctional eating behaviors? Well, um, malnutrition, as I said, is one of the big things. And malnutrition can be starvation, for example, with anorexia nervosa, but also um, just intermittent restriction and then binge eating, purging. <laughs> just leading to uh, vitamin deficiencies, electrolyte disturbances, and ultimately the brain just does not function and, and becomes sort of a different entity. You look at somebody, you, you know, two people. One, um, they both go on an extreme diet after New Year's and mm. um, lose some weight, and one of the two decides to abandon the diet after a week or two. The other one continues and it, it, and it kind of intensifies and they get to a place where it becomes almost unescapable. Un, um, the person can't stop it and something has sort of clicked and they now uh, have something more than a diet, you know. So right. this is the person who comes to the table genetically with a predisposition. And let's talk about when someone that might be predisposed to an eating disorder or have an eating disorder, they look in the mirror. Why do some people mm -hmm. not see themselves as they actually appear mm -hmm. in that mirror? That's one of the most perplexing mm -hmm. symptoms. And people are still trying to elucidate um, really what that is in terms of the brain. We know some things. There's a lot of um, research going on that's very interesting, including brain scans and looking at you know, the way a person responds to things. So we know that people, for example, with anorexia, where that's one of the main features is this kind of seeing yourself as overweight, even though you technically are not. Um, right. We know that there's some difficulty with the parietal lobe, which is kind of the part of the brain that senses the person in space and, mm -hmm. and also is tuned into the internal um, sensations like temperature and, and heartbeat and all of that. And people with, with anorexia really can't do that as well. They have really poor, what we call it, interoceptive awareness. And so it, there's issues with that and the parietal lobe, which again can lead to just really not sensing your body the way it actually is. So can the brain be fixed? I mean, what can yeah. be done to change that? Good question too. So the brain um, is a malleable thing, meaning it can change and um, modify itself. The, if the brain is starved or malnourished, the chances are slim. But with nutritional restoration, the brain really can can heal it, be healed. And with the not just you know food, that's just the bottom line, you need food, but then therapy, real good work in therapy and um, medications and, um, and, and nutrition, the three together can really heal the brain and give a person a, a future that they would not have had otherwise. And you mentioned this earlier a little bit, but we hear the term food is medicine a lot. Right. But in this case, it really is medicine. I mean, can we talk more about that, why that's so important? Well, food is medicine. I mean, especially if someone's malnourished, mm -hmm. because you see all the um, all the things come out that 
our extreme anxiety, depression, all of that stuff is a kind of a consequence of starvation. That was shown in a really well-known study, the um, Keys starvation study, where this psychologist had a, a bunch of actually male males who were wanting to um, avoid the draft sign up for a study where they were essentially starved and they actually ultimately looked a lot like anorexic patients. They had the same body image issues, they had the same, they, um, they hoarded food, they binged, they, they, uh, you know, they themselves started out healthy and they ended up with eating disorders. So we know that nutrition plays such a, such a role. They recovered when they were refed, for the most part. And um, we know, so we know that you need to be fed. That's the, the first step in in, in treating the eating disorder. So it is a brain disease and it comes out with malnutrition. Mm -hmm. Dr. Diego, that's really interesting. This is really important yeah. information and so appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. All right, and if you want to find out more about our month-long partnership with Silver Hill Hospital, you can visit our website at han.network.